afternoon. Good afternoon. So, um, so how many people really do live on Nantucket? Um, is, is the year-round population really as big as we think? And, and doesn't it feel like there's 100,000 people here this summer instead of the 60,000 we've always been told there are on Nantucket? Well, the speculation is over. I think after a year of, of analysis and research, this afternoon we're going to hear the facts. And today I think we've hit on a topic of huge concern of Nantucket based upon the crowd here and also on the wait list that we had for tickets today. I, I ask you to please join me in welcoming the man really behind this, the founder of the uh, data project here on Nantucket. Please welcome Alan Warden. Who are we as a community? About a year and a half ago, several of us were at a planning retreat and we were talking about Nantucket. And we asked ourselves that really basic question, who are we? And we were curious and we wondered how would we begin to think about answering that? And so obviously we needed some solid data. So how many people live here? How many visit? What's the peak day? What's the peak number? Where do these visitors come from? For decades, there have been no shortage of opinions about how many people live here about these, all of these pressing questions, but there's been a dearth of data. And uh, we've heard a big range of numbers. The US Census recently estimated there are a little over 11,000 permanent residents, but I've heard numbers as high as 25,000, and from some of you in the audience, I've heard numbers even higher. And even despite the fact that there are some folks in every community that we know are uncounted, there's no shortage of opinions on how many uncounted there actually are. So while you might think these questions are fodder for trivia games around the dining room table or a bar stool downtown, there are real implications to not knowing. Imagine being responsible for emergency services and not knowing how many people live here. Imagine being responsible for behavioral health when you don't understand the profile of the community. You don't understand the cadence of need. You don't know how to staff. Uh, and, um, and other issues related to behavioral health, which is a huge concern. And what if you're a small business person trying to figure out in your seasonal business, when do you open, when do you close? If you're right, you can earn a few dollars, but if you're wrong, you could go into the winter down $10,000 or more. That has a huge impact. As we talk to community leaders, we ask them a pretty simple question. Are you confident you're making decisions using reliable data? And it's, it's really a simple question. And we watch these leaders hesitate, and reluctantly and honestly, they say no. They don't have a good data resource. So whether it's business, nonprofits, or government, these dedicated leaders tell us that making decisions without data resources is a major concern. So what if we actually developed a community data resource? a reliable, constantly upgraded reservoir of data to help the community make smarter decisions. So about 18 months ago, a group of us decided we wanted to live in a place with that kind of resource. And we called it a community data platform. And for the last 18 months, we've been building one for Nantucket. The Nantucket data platform goes beyond data. It also provides analysis and insights visualizations and support to people who want to make smart decisions. It's a break-even community initiative staffed by volunteers and underpaid data folks, some of whom are here. And I'm Alan Worden, I'm the fo volunteer founder. Some of you may remember that old TV commercial uh, where a character actor used to say, I'm not a doctor, I just play one on TV. Well, I'm not a trained data scientist, but boy, am I learning a ton. And I'm learning it from people who really care about the basic idea of trying to help communities be smarter and stronger by making evidence-based decisions. So, and you're gonna meet a few of those uh, colleagues today. You know, um, once in a while, I get lost in regressions, uh, something I did not do well in with college. But I've actually learned over the last year and a half they can be incredibly powerful and they can really provide insights about this community. 
and I can get bleary-eyed looking at rows and rows of data that's interesting for a while until it's time to pack it up for the day. But what I've learned is the power in data analytics actually is not in the data. And that was pretty surprising to learn. What I've learned from a lot of folks over the last year, the power in data is coming up with pressing questions. What needs to be better understood? Who can be helped? Can we be impactful? The rest follows from there. Gathering data for data's sake doesn't advance the ball. Now, curious people uh, aren't always right, but curiosity is a big part of what drives us. Um, what we, we accept that uh, occasionally we'll be wrong, and that's okay, because we know we're working on version one, V1, and then there's V2. And when we started, we said, in five years, we'll have so much more data. Think how much more we'll learn. So it's really not a game of gotcha or getting the perfect answer. It's a game of being curious, about asking smart questions, and learning as you go. For the past year, we've been trying to answer a question posed by Wendy Schmidt and Melissa Philbrick at our planning retreat. Who are we as a community? And over the next hour, we'd like to share with you some of, our some of what our collective curiosity has led us to so far, and there's more to do. We'll show you the community data platform we use to figure out questions and insights. We'll share our research and some pretty cool visualizations, one of my favorite things. We'll get National Public Radio's Mindy Todd to help us understand a bit more deeply by interviewing our team, one of our team of five demographers, uh, Peter Morrison, as well as our lead data analyst, um, uh, Anna Tapp. And Wendy Schmidt, the author of our first pressing question, will say a few words and then we'll wrap up. So this, the other thing I've learned is this is a field of unbelievably passionate people. And they see the opportunity, as Brian Grazer saw it, you know, curiosity is a way of changing the world. And I can't think of a better person uh, to have come and speak to us than our keynote, Jake Porway. Jake actually is a data scientist. He doesn't just play one on TV. Um, he has worked at NASA and the New York Times R&D lab. He's spoken at the White House and the Clinton Global Initiative. And a few years back, he had the foresight to found Datakind, one of the truly most impactful data efforts in the world today. So please join me in welcoming Jake to Nantucket. I have to say, it's not often that I get a sold out crowd of people coming for data, so I'm already my people. I'm so thrilled. And thank you, Alan, so much for having me. Uh, before Alan gives the big reveal about the Nantucket data platform, uh, he asked me to come here and just talk a little bit about what we're seeing in the world of people using data for good. Um, and my hope is that I can sort of raise some new ideas, uh, get thinking about some innovative things we're seeing out in the world and how this really works, uh, so that there's something to sort of you know, think about looking towards the future. Uh, so I'm going to do that, but look, we've used the term data so many times already. Let, just help me understand where we're all at. Join me in an exercise. Just close your eyes for a second and just picture data. That's right. Let it wash over you. Picture big data or whatever term you've heard. And now open your eyes and just yell out, what, what did you see? Numbers. Numbers. Yes. Oh, exactly. Punch cards, graphs. Yeah. People picture spreadsheets. Rows of numbers, I heard computers over there, or worse, the anonymous tunnel of blue zeros and ones. Yeah, and this is like how a lot of us think of data. I even end up thinking of data this way. And it's so tragic because these are such opaque ideas of data when data is in fact shifting everything we do. It's touching all of our lives every day already. And if you don't know what I'm talking about or you need an example, it might be helpful to think back to a different time in history, before the data craze, before big data, all the way back in the dark ages of uh, 2007, when this is what it was like to rent a movie. <laughs> Do you remember this? Oh my god, you didn't know it was good or bad, you didn't know what you were going to like or not, it was this horrible, depressing time for humanity. <laughs> but now, thankfully, we live in 2018, where with the click of a button, I can see customized movie recommendations, I know it's going to be what I'm going to like or not, and I can make better decisions about how to spend my Friday night. And we can all do this thanks to data. That's right, so much data flowing into Netflix's algorithms about what we watch, what we like, what we don't. 
And of course, it's not just Netflix, right? This is how Google figures out the fastest route from A to B. It's how Alexa interprets all the things you're saying to figure out you're trying to order a pizza. And it's how Amazon figures out what you're likely to buy. Yeah, that's my, no shame, that's my page. I like my Snuggie. <laughs> it's accurate, they're really good. But like the big change about all this, it was, you know, it's not the spreadsheets, it's not the boring stats class in high school. It's about 10 years ago we started digitizing our planet. Cell phones are probably in everyone's pockets in this room. There's more cell phones on the planet than people. Uh, the laptops that are running this are all spitting out data. We're surrounding our globe with sensors across land, air, and sea. And when you think about it that way, Think about data, it's not boring math class, it's not a business opportunity alone. It, it, we're talking about the nervous system of our, of our species. And that's so exciting, because you start to ask, well then what could we learn about ourselves, about our communities, about our world that we never knew before? It's a huge new opportunity, and dare I say, possibly a new age of reason. And yet, think about the examples that we just brought up, ordering pizza, watching movies, let's face it, they're kind of first world problems. Nothing wrong with that, like I said, I love my Snuggie. But we started to wonder if this is such a new technology, aren't there other ways that we could be using this for more than just making sure that, you know, you don't end up watching Cloverfield when you really wanted to watch The Purge, something like that. So we started to ask, how would that happen? How would we use data science for social good? And I started with the people I knew best first, data scientists. Yes, nerds like me who know how to use data and extract meaning from it. And the thing about data scientists you may not know is we're an enthusiastic bunch. We don't just work on data nine to five. No, people are working on side projects on their nights and weekends. In fact, there's something called hackathons. Uh, if you're not familiar, they're 24 or 48 hour experiences where technologists just come together and see what cool stuff they can build. And I remember going to my first hackathon thinking, this is it. This is great. I'm sitting next to this data scientist from Google, or fantastic, uh, a NASA scientist. This is how we're gonna make change. We can build whatever we want. We're gonna make stuff that's so high impact. We make stuff that changes the world, stuff that really drives things forward. And in just 48 hours, we built stuff that was so, Disappointing. <laughs> oh no, this team built a thing that has Alexa show you where on the shelf you can get the thing you asked for online. It's fine, right, but it's more the same, right? Because if you ask someone, you know, a data scientist to solve a problem, they're probably gonna solve their own. They probably look like me. My problem is not finding low food, you know, uh, cheap food, it's like cheap beer. So you end up with a lot of the same kind of stuff. So maybe technologists aren't the sole solution. But here's the really cool thing. One of the great things about this democratization of data, the digitization of the planet, is that organizations you wouldn't think of as tech companies are becoming data and tech companies, including small nonprofits like this. It's a group called Conservation International. And one of the things they do is they set up these cheap cameras that collect information about when animals go in front of them, because they're devoted to conservation. And so they've got these streams of digital data coming in. They could recognize the animals, they could predict what their paths are. If they match this with satellite imagery data, they could understand way more about these communities than ever before. So you start to think, this is it. The nonprofits, they're gonna become these new data-driven organizations. They're gonna drive data for good. Until you remember that they have no one to help them do that. Oh man, data scientists are expensive. And with headlines like this, that AI researchers are making over a million dollars a year, even at a nonprofit, poof, forget it. No one's gonna be able to build a data science team. So I guess we're just stuck, right? And there's no way to do this. We've got data scientists who know how to use data and are basically volunteering their time to just work on tech projects, but no social connection, and social organizations that could be using data but have no one help them do it. Well, of course, you're probably thinking what we thought, which was, can we just get these two together? Let's bring them together, and that, that's really how we started DataKind. So a nonprofit dedicated to using data science, AI, and the service of humanity, and it basically works like Doctors Without Borders for data geeks. You get people from Facebook and Google to work alongside Conservation International. Together, they whip up whole new technologies that allow us to all live in a better world. So let me show you just a few quick examples of what this looks like and why I think this is so exciting given the conversation we're having today. So the first comes from the American Red Cross. Now they had a, a very serious problem, which is that thousands of people die every year from preventable fires. They don't have smoke alarms in their houses, so if there's a fire, it just catches their building or house, they can't get out and they die. It's horrible. So the Red Cross says we're gonna put an end to this. We're gonna put five million smoke alarms for free all across the US. And that's great, but then you ask, where do you start? And they didn't know, they said, maybe we just go knock on doors, do you have a smoke alarm? If not, here's one. It would never work, they don't have the resources to do that. So we teamed them up with some data scientists in DC who said, hey, we can take data at your organization, data from local community platforms about demographics and housing and information like that, and we can mush that all together and basically predict where in the US there, these fires are most likely to happen, and you can just go directly there. 
So now the Red Cross uses this. It's like they're using smart intelligence. They're going to those areas. And every month, they send a letter to the volunteers saying, hey, this month, we saved 500 more families from fire death. So I think it's a great example of using a nonprofit's data, community data, some data scientists to try to drive social impact and make it more efficient. Another example comes from the Molten Niguel Water District. And their job is to get water to people in Southern California. As you may know, there are lots of droughts there. So it's really important that they get this right. If they underestimate how much water people need, the only recourse they have is to fill up a dump truck across the state, fill it with water, and ship it to that area. A huge waste of time, energy, it's really destructive. So they really want to estimate how much water people need. So we teamed them up with some folks, including the director of data science from Netflix, of all places, and they built this tool that allows them to predict block by block how much water people are going to need. So now the water district is giving millions of people clean water, and they've already saved over $25 million because they have this insight in this tool. The last example I want to tell is about one where they are actually doing a little bit of a natural experiment, saying, are our services working? And this comes from the New York City Parks Department. Now, they have data on every tree in the city, which they refer to as the urban forest, which I just find is such a beautiful term for New York City's trees, and not something I necessarily think of as I'm stepping over piles of garbage in New York. But it's beautiful, and they have all this data about the trees, but they don't really analyze it. And they said, you know, we're really curious about a lot of things, but in particular, we do this thing that we just do by gut. We go out and we tell people, uh, like our, our workers, if you see a tree limb hanging down, go prune it, because we don't want that falling on someone's tree or, or grandpa or anything. And so that should reduce the number of problems we have. But we have no idea if that's actually making a difference. Can we find out from this data? So we team them up with this guy, Brian D'Alessandro, who spends his time as a data scientist in an ad company saying, if I show you this ad, are you more or less likely to buy the thing? That's the same statistics and math you need to say, if I prune this tree limb, are you more or less likely to have emergencies? So the team built a ton of things for the Parks Department, including a bunch of maps that helped them see risks of uh, hurricanes and flooding. But the thing that Brian did was he found a number, 23%. There are 23% fewer tree emergencies on those blocks where they're doing the pruning than when they're not. So now New York City Parks Department says, this is fantastic. We know this works. Let's fund it. Let's build it out. But more interestingly, cities around have started writing to them and saying, hey, we have the same kind of data. How did you do it? Let's test our programs, too. So I think it's a really exciting example of where having a data platform that you're learning stuff from can actually influence communities around. Now, one example I want to give just to show as well that though we're talking a lot about data here, the frontier of data and, and, and data and technology is still moving, and people are still finding ways to use it for social impact. So just to kind of dream ahead a few years, um, one of the most recent developments in computer science is the ability for computers to recognize objects and images. So you can see in the city scene, a computer is saying, here, there's a car, there's a person. Normally, you'd see this on like self-driving cars. But a bunch of enterprising people said, hey, we can use this for social impact in our community. What they realized is you can use the same thing for identifying animals. And not just groups of animals like giraffes, but specific animals, like a very specific whale shark that they're tracking. So what they're doing now is they're using this and they're pulling in all these YouTube videos of everyone who's out on a whale watch, who's taking their pictures out with a bunch of people on sharks, and they're identifying the individual animals in them. So in a way, the whole community is becoming their sensor. They're tracking for conservation. And what they're doing beyond this, the bot even leaves a little note on your YouTube page if it finds one. It says here, we found whale shark P323 in your video. Here's everything we know about this shark from our research. That's fantastic, right? I also like this response. Wow, and you're an AI. From all of humanity, please don't conquer us. <laughs> Honestly, that was, I'd, I'd like to be conquered by that AI. Of all the AI, the like, conservation AI seems like a pretty nice one. Um, now, this may seem far out and futuristic, but the thing that's cool about this to me is it's using some, you could think of YouTube data kind of as public data, and there's all this code and data technology that's out there that you could even just download and kind of run something similar yourself now. So there's a lot, you know, not only is it an exciting time today, the stuff we're moving into in the future is even more exciting. So uh, those are just a few quick examples of stuff we've seen. Um, at Datakind, we've done over 250 projects, over 18,000 volunteers around the world, including in communities in Bangalore and Singapore and San Francisco, and they're doing data for good work. I say that because we could just stop here. I just go, hey, wow, that's cool. It's a little bunch of interesting data projects. Hopefully you think they're cool. Um, but we have a little more time. And so the thing that I wanted to talk about as well is to say, from all these projects, we've learned some tricks about what makes these things work well and not. Because none of those projects came fully baked like this. And what we found over time is that a lot of people think, hey, if I just get a data scientist, I could just sprinkle them in with my data and my nonprofit, and everything will be better. But it never works like that. It's almost never the way it works. And the reason is all these problems you're trying to solve, you know, preventing fires, distributing water, they're actually they're social problems. And that makes them very tricky to solve. And you can't just throw a little bit of tech at it. 
In fact, there was a guy back in the 70s who thought about naming these kinds of problems. He studied problems, and he came up with a term for these you may have heard called wicked problems. And he said, you know, these are wicked problems because they're problems that are difficult or impossible to solve because of incomplete, contradictory, and changing requirements that are often difficult to recognize. When you think about, say, homelessness, I mean, there's a classic example. It's not just about getting people more homes. You have to also address mental health. And if you're going to do that, you need job skill training. And to do that, you need to know the economy and market. It gets complicated really quickly. Whew, I know, a little daunting, right? But there's good news. Uh, Horst said, hey, there's a way to get around these, which is that you can't just rely on any one type of person or person to solve it. You have to bring a lot of people together from all different walks. And so at Datakind, we actually think about six critical roles that you need to do a really good data science for social good project. So I'll, I'll say these very quickly, um, but I think it's important as you go to use the Nantucket data platform, maybe you're thinking about these. So one's just a super clear problem statement. You heard Alan say it, you gotta know what it is you're trying to solve. Don't start with the data, start there. You do of course need the data sets, gotta have those in the top right. Of course you need some data scientists, people who can analyze those, like Anna, who you're gonna hear from in a little bit. Um, but then down below, we also include funders and subject matter experts to say, how does this problem fit in the context of a broader social issue that we may not understand? And lastly, with social actors, we think about who's going to use this? Who's the nonprofit? Who, who's this for? And so it's funny because a lot of people think that those answers all come for free, but they're actually really hard to get all together. So if you're going to go off and embark on your own data for good at, uh, questions, ask yourself, which of these do we already have and which do maybe we still need? Which role might I be able to play? So we think about that a lot. But then even once you have all those all together, there's three things that we've seen that work to actually make them work well together. And so I want to talk about really quickly three principles for applying data to social good. All right, first thing, echoing Alan, finding problems is a lot harder than finding solutions. And what I mean by this is the Red Cross didn't come and say, we want to prevent fires or we want to target smoke alarms. They said, we've got data, what do we do? And so we had to sit and talk with them and say, well, what's the problem you're trying to solve? Oh, we're trying to stop preventable fires. OK, cool. So where do you go? We don't know. OK, we could use data to do that. And so there's a really long conversation process that it takes to get there. So if you're a data scientist going into this or you want to work with the data, I would say, think about how are you going to find that problem? Who are you going to talk to about? It's going to take some time. And if you're someone who wants a question answered from the Nantucket data platform, spend your time now. Don't rely on the technologist. Think, hmm, what is my problem? What is it so crisply? And then we'll figure out if the data can solve it. Let's say that's number one. We always think a, a problem well scoped is half solved. Number two, oh man, communications is so much more important than technology. The technology actually ends up being a really small part of this. And what I mean by that is when you bring data scientists together with nonprofits, with community members, people can easily get on different pages. Uh, at Datakind, I often say we're jargon police. So anytime someone says something like API, we're like, hold on, technologist, let's explain what that means to everybody. Or someone says, you know, a, a nonprofit term. So I think this is a, an important meta lesson, is that as you're working with these folks around technology, don't shirk the communication around it. How are you going to communicate these results? I saw an entire team do fantastic work for a uh, foster care group and torch all the results because they got up on stage to present the results. And the lead guy said, this is fantastic work we've done. Uh, the you know, multi-level regression showed a P-score value of 0 0.005. And R -score, oh, everyone fell asleep. And their faces fell off. And no one heard what he said. So I think it's a really important thing that gets overlooked. You've got to communicate between the people in the project and at the end. And then very lastly, uh, design with, not for. And this is a phrase that basically means uh, you've got to have the stuff that you're be building alongside the community. Won't be a problem here in Nantucket. You're all here in this room, so you're clearly engaged. But you often see technologists go off and say, hey, I'm going to build this for folks in Africa, or I'm going to build this problem for other people. It never quite works. And really, the way that you get around this is you have a community in the room when you're building. So when we did a project with foster care NGOs, we had foster children in the room saying, how would this work? And that's a really important step that a lot of people miss. So if the first part of this talk is, hey, data is really great. Look at all the stuff we could do. This second part is, by the way, there's a lot of human parts of this, too, that are really important for getting it right. So you don't just build a lot of flashy things, but nothing really happens. So we really think human-centered design principles are really critical. Get involved. This is a really important part of collaboration. OK, so we can still stop there, right? I know, and I've got like one minute left. We can stop there, except there's probably a few of you in the crowd who are thinking this one thought that I know I thought, which is like, hmm, talking a lot about how good data is, Jake, but uh, what about privacy? What about the ethics of this stuff? You know data is not always good. Yeah, there's a kind of a pall around this. Let's like bring it down for a sec. There's articles like Silicon Valley is not your friend coming out, talking about the tech industry. We hear a lot about Cambridge Analytica and Facebook who are collecting data and possibly misusing it, possibly destroying liberal democracy. Maybe or maybe not. Uh, 
there's a lot there, right? There's, there's a lot of anxiety around collecting data. And, and really what I think about this debate that we're in these days about how we should use data properly, I'm reminded of this fantastic quote uh, by Marshall McLuhan, which is that we, sh we become what we behold. We shape our tools and then our tools shape us, right? And so you can, the simple version of that is once you've got a hammer, everything looks like a nail. But you think as we're building these data solutions, as you're thinking about distributing water or solving problems, once they're there, they start to shape how we do things. And the thing I think is really important to think about is whose job is it to maintain the ethics of that? Who is going to make sure this is used well? So an example I think of in a community we've heard about was when Microsoft developed a tool that would allow you to avoid crime-ridden neighborhoods if you had a, you know, Google Maps or Bing Maps. And, uh, you know, that's great. When I go to a city that I don't know, I don't necessarily want to walk through a crime-ridden area. But you may think, well, what could this possibly create? Uh, this could en enhance a class or a race difference, right? Where wealthy people with cell phones are avoiding poorer areas, but possibly people of color or marginalized communities. Now, is that good? Is that bad? That's not actually the real question. The question is, who has the ability to shape this stuff? Is it the poor engineer whose boss asked them to build this? Is it that manager? Is it us as a community? And if this is kind of heavy for an afternoon, I'll simply say this, the answer though we could go into this in a lot more depth, the answer that we keep hearing is it goes back to the same principles. The way you build technology on data that is upright, that people feel is safe, is using their, their, their data well, is to do it as a community. So that's the thing is we really emphasize collaboration and communicating together. Now, I know that could be a little bit of a down note to end on, so I want to kind of bring us back to where we started with all of this, right? We've gone on a crazy journey of data examples, how to do this well, ethics conversation. But I think this age we're in really gets summed up really well by one idea. This idea by this guy, Joel de Rosne, uh, he wrote this book called The Macroscope in 1979, far before the data age. And he said, you know, all throughout history, humans have developed technology to see the unknown. You know, first we developed the telescope. That allowed us to see the infinitely great, the stars and the planets and the cosmos. And we understood more about our place in the universe than ever before. Then we invented the microscope. Oh, and the microscope let us see the infinitesimally small. We learned about microbes and germs, and all health took huge steps forward, and we lived so much longer. But what we need now, what we're missing, is like a macroscope, something that would let us see the infinitely complex, the patterns of society and nature that we can't observe with the naked eye. And that's really, to me, the takeaway that I'm so excited by. This data age, the digitization of everything, the Nantucket data platform is a piece of that. This is the macroscope. We can now see that infinitely complex. And the question now is, what are we going to do with it? Because it's now being placed in all of your hands. And I say all of yours because that's really the only way this is going to work well. If you take nothing else away from this talk, I hope it's that. That this is not just for the technologists. It's not just for the community members. It's for everyone, nonprofit, foundation member, member of the community, concerned citizen. This is a place to come around and decide what we're going to do when we build this together. Because it's only when we're all working together that we're going to go beyond using data to make you know, better decisions about the kind of movies we want to see we actually start using data to make better decisions about the kind of world we want to see. Thanks very much. I'll turn it back over to Al. That was awesome. When we, uh, we saw Jake give a TED Talk <coughs> uh, on YouTube, and we said, oh, maybe we could play the TED Talk. And I said, no, 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 we're going to go get Jake. So I'm really, <laughs> really glad we got Jake. And uh, as we talked, um, we realized that, believe it or not, totally through luck, uh, maybe we're a little smart. Uh, we have a very similar framework on how we think about problems. And so I'm going to go through this. This is very quick, so bear with me. Um, the first thing we want to do, and we talked about it earlier, is identify a pressing question. What's the problem you're trying to solve? And then we want to think about how we build a great team. So for this pressing question, who are we as a community? Uh, we had demographers, geographers, uh, statisticians, data scientists, data architects, visualizers. And you'll meet some of them today. Uh, you need to aggregate and curate data. Not all data is good, so you've got to be thoughtful about what you want, how good is it, uh, how do you whip it into shape. Then you've got to do your analysis, and, uh, and from that come insights and compelling visualizations. So that's every problem, every data, every problem we're trying to solve, we look at it in that way. Pressing question, great team, aggregate the data, undertake analysis, and come up with visualizations. Um, and then we need to support because these problems don't go away. We know, we think we know the population pretty well now. We understand it a lot better. But guess what? It changes today. I, you'll, you won't look at fairies in the same way. Uh, <laughs> I was in the stop and shop the other day, and my son saw me and said, what are you doing? And he said, what are you thinking about? And I was thinking about how many people are in the stop and shop. <laughs> um, so th this will change uh, your life. 
Um, so we want to talk about the effective population. And uh, there's some comp very complicated math. Let me show you how complicated this is. Let's figure out how many people live here. Let's add seasonal residents. Let's add year-round commuters. There are some seasonal workers. And we have visitors. And if you execute this very complicated formula, you will know the effective population. And the reason the effective population is important is, as we know, emergency services aren't driven by uh, the year-round population, they're driven by how many people are here at any moment. And the fact that there is a massive ebb and flow here, and we don't really understand it yet, um, is a problem. Th that's the problem we've been trying to solve. So here's the first visualization. I'm going to show you a variety. It's sort of our workshop. Um, so this is called a bubble graph. And uh, he, there's something called an Nantucket Street List. It's a register of Nantucketers. Think of it as a phone book. Um, and we went to a database because we knew that wasn't complete, uh, a database called Civis. And we looked at 250 million people. We ran it through a filter. And we said, find Nantucketers. And they found 3,000. Um, so now we've got uh, the Civis Nantucketers. We've got 3,000 of those. We've got the 11,000 on the street list, adults, held by uh, the town clerk. And you put those together and you say, okay, we've got 14,000 people, 14,000 adults. Well, the funny thing is adults have children. So how many children? Children are protected by privacy. So we did some uh, heavy duty lifting around calculating children. Um, we believe there are 3,200. And you put that together and uh, you have a mathematical answer of 17,160, which we rounded up to 17,200. <laughs> Um, and, uh, you know, there's a margin of error there. Uh, there are uncounted. We're going to continue to work on that. But we think this is a reasonable stake in the ground and one of my personal favorite visualizations. I think it's cool looking. A simpler way to do it is uh, called a Seiki flow. You do all this work on this complicated uh, uh, bubble graph, and then you look at this and you go, that's pretty easy. 11,000 streetlight, 3,000 civis Nantucketers. We've got 14,000 adults, 3,200 children you end up on the far right with 17,200. So once we knew how many people lived here, then we spent a lot of time going down a bunch of rabbit holes that weren't fruitful, which was how do you figure out how many people are here if they're coming and going? Do we look at electric meters? Do we look at the dump? Uh, what are the indicators? And we realized that, well, if we could get data from the High Line and the steamship and from the airlines, those are the only ways to get here. We could actually count. And uh, I've been quoted as saying, you know, essentially there is a counter on the island. Uh, we've improved on that uh, thanks to Anna and some of our data team. Uh, other communities can do what we figured out to do. Uh, but we said, okay, well, let's count. So we figured out at th essentially the trip level how many people were on every ferry and every plane for the last year. So we looked at 2017. And uh, this is another one of my favorite graphs. So this is a radial polar chart. Um, it's a good way to see the, the year. Um, you see the month there. There's a scale that might be a little hard to see in the back, uh, but it's 10,000, 20, 30. The outer edge is 40,000. And we put in, uh, again, daily population counts. These are highly reliable. And the dips are weekends where people are going away. And then you kind of march through March, and you know, March is tough here, um, and early March, we know the island deflates by 12%. And uh, so now we're going to go along, and guess what happens? Boom. What's that? <laughs> Daffodil weekend. Up 20% in one week. Population moves 20%. Now we're going to march along. You guys know what's coming next. Fagawi. 7,700 people came that weekend. In the course of one week, the population went up 30%. So now we're going to march along, and these peaks are weekends. July 4th. Uh, uh, we're up by a third. So now we're going to go along, you're going to see weekend population peaks until you get to that. Off the charts, that's the Boston Pops weekend. And we know it is the number one day of the year last year. Um, and, uh, and we know it was Sunday night at 7 o'clock. And then people started to leave. Uh, now the end is near. <laughs> Labor Day, we reclaim our island, down 20%. But the wedding business is pretty good, right? You're going to see it. That's what the wedding business looks like. And then we march to Christmas Stroll, where we have another blast until we settle down and people leave for the holidays. So that's another one of my favorite charts. That's the population of Nantucket, uh, version one. <laughs> so
So the high season is what drives the economy here, and so we wanted to focus on the high season. So we did another radial chart, uh, but we started here in May, and we went around to October. And what we looked at is the net flow of people per day. Some of this is a little technical, but with the colors, it's, it's sort of cool. So we're going to start marching along here, and, uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll settle in. So here we go. Uh, this one's a little interesting to look at. You can keep referencing the left, the yellow, to kind of know where you are. So again, there's Fugawi, uh, dramatically up and then down on Sunday. We march along, and there's a pattern. Data will show you patterns. There's a pattern. Look at it, over and over and over. Starts to rise Monday, peaks uh, Thursday, Friday, and then boom, Sunday, people leave. The only time you see that uh, not playing out is right after July 4th, which so many people come that they leave over the next sort of week or 10 days. Now we're into August, and again, it's just a slow build, so you're not seeing the drama you see with July 4th. Labor Day, big weekend, up and down. Now you're going to see weddings again. Guess what it's going to look like? Peak, peak, peak. So that's the season. That's, that's what the uh, uh, May to October looks like. And then I got into the motion graphics, but you know, it can be a little much. So sometimes uh, you just want to look at something simple. This <laughs> is minute by minute. So we looked at a Saturday in, in July, and we said, well, geez, if we have the data and we have trip level data, we know who, came, who left on a 6.30 boat and who came on the noon boat. The data team said, well, we could tell you the population by minute. I said, really? They said, sure, we have the data. And so there it is. That's a day. So what you see on the right is the early riser. If you're on that 6.30 boat, six, uh, and this, uh, this was an average of the four Julys, um, Saturdays last year. Uh, those are people per minute or is the scale. So that's about six people per minute. So in one hour, 360 people left, and it was actually 363 people left on the 630 boat. And then we've got other boats and flights coming, and then a dip. And by 1030 in the morning, we know we're growing in July, right? We're going to have a net increase. Uh, but by 1030 in the morning, we're kind of even, and then it's grow, 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 a little dip in the afternoon, grow, grow. Biggest activity is 330 in the afternoon. Which makes sense, it's turnover, people have spent the day, and it's time to go, other people are arriving. So visitors are a big driver of the economy, so we wanted to really understand visitors. So this was a guy we found in Seattle who was just, had won a bunch of visualization awards, and we said, gee, we, through the use of mobility data, which Anna will talk a little bit about, um, we kind of know where our visitors come from. What, what do you think? And this is what we got, which was pretty cool. Mobility data, I would say quickly, is, you know, as Jake referred to, we all have smartphones, not all of us. But you have a GPS chip, you uh, give permissions to have your location uh, determined. Uh, that can get aggregated by the company and anonymized. Um, and the uh, anonymity of that data is really important. Uh, and then it can get sold to research companies. And we have a relationship with one of them, Streetlight Analytics. And they can look at that, and they can't look at you individually, but they can look at groups of people. And we sort of know the zip codes people are coming from. If there aren't enough people, we don't know, they won't give us the data. So we know general sort of neighborhood zip code-y things or where they're coming from. That's how we made this map. And then it'd be cool if you could say, well, make everyone a plane. So what happens on, what happens on a Saturday in July? Well, I mean, people are coming from all over the country. Kind of, you know it. But now we get to see it. And then we said, OK, well, let's look for a whole year. So in the bottom right, you'll see a playback by month. So this is January. These are zip codes that are visiting Nantucket in January, February, March. We're going to go along. Guess what's going to happen, right? We're going to see more and more color. And it's going to stretch out. The Texans start to come. <laughs> Californians are here in August. And so if you're a small business person and you're trying to figure out how to spend your marketing dollars, it'd be nice to know where your visitors come from. So that was a kind of an interesting one. And then we can get behind that data and again, looking at these sort of neighborhoods, not individuals, we can look at the neighborhoods and say, you know, where are their income levels, what's the family status, et cetera, et cetera. Well, this was something that was personally of interest to me. 
How many of you have heard there are more New Yorkers here in August than Bostonians, right? It's an age-old um, untruth, I found out. <laughs> so what you see as a Boston fan, this got me a lot of joy, uh, Boston dominates New York throughout the season, uh, doubling the New York count. Uh, the only exception being New York makes a run in late August, and Bostonians, knowing they have it in the bag, uh, leave. Um, <laughs> So it is not true that there are more, there are more New Yorkers, and, uh, and you can see that in early August. There are more, but not more, than, not, uh, not more New, York, New Yorkers than Bostonians. And then we had some fun. We, uh, we um, geofenced beaches, and we said, can we see if people have favorites? So Hingham likes jetties and New Canaan's down in Cisco, and a bunch of you all from Atlanta apparently like Wisconsin. And then we said, well, how about stop and shop? What, could we understand anything about shopping? Well, we did. What we figured out is um, the smart people shop early and late. <laughs> and the visitors, I love that I struggled with this word favor, visitors favor, as if they, they actually don't know, and so they go between 10 and 2, and then it's sort of a jump ball between 2 and 6. So one of the things we really want to look at and understand is, is weather. Right? Weather drives a lot of this island. This is really the first weather uh, dashboard that we've put together. Uh, the, t the top, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but the top shows ferries, uh, all the ferries for last year in yellow. And uh, in blue are, is the airline passengers. And uh, at, at the uh, x-axis you see um, how many people are coming potentially. And then the wind speed. And what you can see is, guess what, as the wind goes up, things get canceled. And so we're starting to understand that if you're traveling and the wind is blowing over 20, your odds of, of actually traveling drop by about 30%. So there's more to do here, but uh, it was interesting. And then uh, this fellow we're working with in Berkeley said, well, we ought to look at wind direction. And so uh, you know, it made sense to me once I thought about it. Uh, the biggest implication for slowing down uh, ferry traffic is with northerly winds. Makes sense, big nor'easter and things are gonna get canceled. And so that's what that one does in the bottom. So that's, um, and, and what I would say, and I'll come back to it, but you all got a paper, and if you didn't, you can get it on the way out. Uh, this is our white paper, and uh, we decided that we would have an executive summary for some of you, um, oh, and that's the front page. And then there's a paper written by the former editor-in-chief of American Demographics, who spent a massive amount of time over the last two months writing this paper with our team. And then we had a technical appendix that was so good and so thoughtful, uh, we didn't want to bury that uh, somewhere, and so we put that as part of the paper. We're going to come back and talk about transparency, but there's sort of you know, three levels of how, how deep do you want to dive, and that's, that's all in here. And so to dive a little deeper, uh, we're going to ask Mindy Todd, uh, Peter Morrison, and Anna Tapp to come up, and I am going to give you a little background on this team. Um, so Mindy Todd um, is with WCAI in, uh, on the Cape and is an award-winning uh, interviewer. Uh, many of you know her, I'm sure, from her shows on public radio. Thanks for coming, Mindy. And, and, and Mindy is here thanks to Nat Philbrick. I said, Nat, who's the best interviewer you know? And he said without a, a pause, it was Mindy Todd. Um, thanks, Nat. <laughs> And uh, next to Mindy is Anna Tapp. Anna's been working with me for a few years trying to understand Nantucket and uh, has been massively involved in virtually every breakthrough we've had. Uh, she lives in North Carolina, uh, but her heart is in Nantucket. So we're delighted to have her here. And uh, at the end over there, we have Peter Morrison. Many of you know him from uh, Cape Air, uh, where he helped us uh, fly safely. And he did that smartly so he could fly at discounts to visit his grandchildren on the West Coast. <laughs> but before his aviation career, uh, Peter was a highly respected demographer with the Rand Corporation. He taught at UPenn. And uh, in addition to his early guidance, the big thing he did was help us build a team of what we call demographer thinking partners. And so uh, we have a team of five demographers. Peter is one of them. Uh, they include Guggenheim Fellows, Fulbright Fellows, uh, a number of university professors, people who uh, have done serious work uh, for the U.S. Census, including one who wrote a handbook for researchers on the U.S. Census, and another one who was the chairman of the scientific committee advising the census. And so uh, pretty much everything we write gets reviewed by Peter's team, 
and uh, has been wildly helpful in the start of what we think will be very fruitful. So uh, with no further ado. I'll be So I am not a data scientist, but Jake, I was like, yeah, this is like really exciting. And, and I was really excited when uh, Alan asked if I would be interested in doing this and looking through some of this. So Peter, I want to start with you because you are uh, a democracy. What does this um, mean for the field? I mean, this is pretty unique, this data that co that's been collected here, kind of combining these different sources. Well, the, the coolest thing about this is the fact that it's been possible to put together a team of people who are really excited by the kinds of stuff you've just looked at. The fact that you can take data and turn data into a profile of what this community really is, which is not a single count of Nantucket's population. It's the dynamics of a procession of people coming and going throughout the year. <clears throat> and that procession uh, really vastly outnumbers the 17,000 of us who live here year round. Uh, when I explained what Alan was trying to do to some of my colleagues, these are guys I work with, drink with, party with. Uh, we call that a, an annual you know, meeting of applied demographers. When I told them about this, I, I said, you know, I said, this is demographers catnip. And I got them involved and they are really embedded in this team. They, they, wanted, they want to see what we're doing. They want to go over what we're writing up. They want to see it published in academic journals. And the exciting part of this is that this is defining a revolutionary way to look at communities uh, across the country. Not just a snapshot with the Census Bureau that says, how many people live in city so-and-so? Well, here's the number. Well, it's not just that number. Uh, the population is changing all the time. We not only know what the number is at different points in time, but we know how many different people there are coming and going. Many, many more times people coming and going than there are here at a given point in time whenever you want to take that snapshot. So I'm most excited about the team we've been able to put together, Alan. So um, Anna, we talked mobility data. So explain what mobility data is. Well, our mobility data partner that we've been using throughout is um, Streetlight Data. And what they do is they have, um, they purchase data that comes from uh, different apps that you install on your phone. So it's all things that you agree because it's good for you that it tracks your location. And then they aggregate it and then they have a really excellent tool that we can use to ask questions of the tool. And the way that they figure out where people live and where people work is they just look at your behavior. Where do you spend most of your nights during the month? That's probably where you live. Where do you spend most of your time in the middle of the day during the month consistently? That's probably where you work. And so um, they figure that out, but then when they deliver it to anybody like us, they aggregate it. So sort of the same way that the Census Bureau aggregates data so you can't pick out individual people, Streetlight does that for us, and we can get all the neat insights that you saw in the graphic. I was pretty amazing when I saw, you know, Atlanta, people from Atlanta like Wisconsin, and a couple of people I know from Atlanta live in Wisconsin. How weird is that? I was like, how do you know that? So mm -hmm. we aren't identifying specific people, and I think that's mm -hmm. the thing people go, well, we see where you spend your evenings, but it isn't you as an individual per se, right? I mean, mm -hmm. Streetlight might, might know that, but they don't give you individual mm -hmm. information. Is that how it works? Yeah, yeah. that's how it works. And um, our really valuable insights came from looking at the ferry terminals and the airports, because every Everybody has to go, um, I mean, I guess there are a few people that have private boats that can get here. I'm not a boat, boat person, but um, I think that most people come and go through those terminals. And so that was kind of our, our snapshot where we could get really good aggregate samples of um, this week, a whole bunch of people came from New York or a whole lot of people came from California and we can see what's going on. The simplest it's way to think about this is streetlight data are telling us about crowds. You look out an airplane window at 40,000 feet at night, mm -hmm. and what you see is a pattern of lights out there, but you can't see anything about what's going on in anybody's house. You just see there's a lot more over there and a lot less over here. So they give us crowds, and they say, well, here's a crowd at one point in time. Here's another crowd. It's 50% bigger, but I'm not going to tell you how many people there are in the crowd, mm -hmm. and I'm not going to tell you anything about it if there isn't at least a fixed, a, a, a minimum number constituting the crowd. So 
All we know is crabs. Yeah. And, and uh, that ties into another really great point, that it wasn't just using that mobility data that was our breakthrough. It was our collaboration with Highline, with the Steamship Authority, with the airport. We needed all of that put together to really come up with the numbers. So um, boats, people who come in on their private boats are not necessarily counted in these numbers then, right? Mm -hmm. We're still working on getting there. So, so that, yeah. that is an area mm -hmm. that you're that Satellites you're rotate. Mm -hmm. the planted every few hours. Mm -hmm. So it's just a matter of how much money you have to buy, how much detail to picture. So the picture. Snapshot once there. a day yeah. over Nantucket Harbor, empty, looks like a lot of sa uh, sailboats mm -hmm. or how many vessels. You can look at that picture and you can get a rough idea how many. All right, so talk, so talk about the census numbers. They had 11,000 something, you guys came with seven. That's a pretty big difference big there. Difference. And that, that has a big meaning into money that comes to Nantucket and services. Absolutely. Yeah, so yeah. talk about that. The, uh, <clears throat> for those of you who don't know, uh, the official count of population in a community uh, not only has to do with allocating political power as you know, <laughs> through redistricting, but it, or reapportionment, but it drives the distribution of billions and billions of dollars of government money from hundreds and hundreds of different little spigots. So every time you are able to count another person officially, uh, you're talking about people have estimated somewhere around $1,000 to $2,000 from God knows how many sources. But that's what's at stake. So if you find another 1,000 people, you're talking about big bucks. Mm -hmm. So what do you think this will mean for the next, uh, for the 2020 census? I mean, that, will they look at these numbers and say, wow, we were really off, we need to fix that? Uh, census is not gonna do anything for us because they have a standard way of enumerating people and they do, they do as thorough a job as can be done uh, with an almost unlimited budget. But what they do after that is, <laughs> <laughs> what they do after that is, uh, you know, the last census we had was in 2010. April 1st, they said, this is what you got. And then what they do is, what about 2011, 2012, 2013? They have a little model that has been used and refined over many, many decades. It works in 95, 98% of American communities. It doesn't work so well in Nantucket though. So they use that and they say, well, we estimate that there are this many people here. The latest estimate was mid uh, July 1st, 2017. And they're off by a couple thousand people. So I say, well, you know, uh, Town clerk says, I can put, a, I can put a, a name on X number of faces that I know live here, and they have certified to me that they have proof of residence. So the Census Bureau's estimation is not really telling us what's going on. So when we have the, two, the 2020 Census, the one message I have for you is be sure you get counted, and if you're afraid to get counted, uh, don't be afraid because you can answer every question you want on the Census, but if you don't answer the one that asks you, are you a citizen? They'll say, well, that's okay. We got all the other information. You know what we're gonna do? We're gonna impute the answer. We can guess what you are. And if you feel comfortable with that, fine. But if you, if you don't answer it, the guy will keep trying to knock on your door and see if they can give you the form. Would you please fill it out? So if you want the Census Bureau to go away, answer the form online, answer what you want, leave one or two questions blank, and get counted because you're worth a thousand dollars. And I talk, there's um, confidence at the counts. The, these are estimates. So talk about estimates versus counts. Um, well, everything that we do in data science is basically, it is an estimate because we don't really know. We're seeking toward the truth and we do have some indicator variables that we use um, as well throughout the process to um, make a really educated guess toward the truth. And so everything that we do comes with a margin of error. Um, but we keep making it better and we keep working towards it and um, we're getting better and better as we go along. And one of the great things that we did with the permanent residents is that we were able to not just, not just model, um, but for the adults, we were able to actually create a list of adults. These are the people that we believe through our different data sources um, live here in Nantucket. Is it everybody? Probably not. Um, there's probably some people that we didn't quite get to, um, but we're still moving toward and we're still working towards it. Peter, talk about um, the ability to have quantitative versus qualitative information and, and you know, other breakthroughs as we're looking at this information. 
Uh, qualitative information is kind of stuff we know, but we can't really enumerate. Uh, you can have one, at, at one end of a spectrum you have something that you can truly count. And Anna and I both know that everything we talk about is really an estimate. The Census Bureau counts a certain number. We say, well, that's their estimate of how many people there are because they got a 99.9% .9 response rate. Qualitative stuff, stuff that we sort of know. We know that, that there are a lot of people who come to Nantucket to fill seasonal jobs. We know that they come from all over the world. We know that they come from former, uh, from, from Eastern European countries that were part of the Soviet Union. We know that they, uh, we have a, a thriving community of people from Nepal. And word of mouth kind of tells people to come here because they can get well-paying jobs for periods of time and then they can go back home. So we know in a qualitative sense that a lot of what happens on Nantucket during the season is something that corresponds to a, a well-recognized pattern of, of human mobility around the world. We don't have so much of it in, in the United States called uh, kind of circular migration. That is to say people leave their homelands, they go someplace, earn a living, and they come back. So they really live in two places, but one of them they really call home. And they're either remitting funds or they're bringing money back home, and that is their way of earning a living. So that's a qualitative kind of phenomenon. We know what's going on here. We can't measure it, but I can guarantee you that that's what's fueling a lot of what happens in Nantucket and has really transformed Nantucket into what I refer to as a miniature immigrant entry port. Mm -hmm. And I think, if, can I add to that? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, one of the exciting things for us as data people and for people like me who aren't a resident of Nantucket, this is actually the first time that I've been here, mm -hmm. even though I feel like I, I've been living here <laughs> from my computer screen, is seeing the intersection of the data and the stories. And um, I always try and keep that in mind when we're doing the data processing, that these are people, these are people with stories, and we have to remember that we're telling their stories, but also listen to their stories. And so I think one of our big things, I guess you could call it a breakthrough, that we took from looking at the different population groups that Alan outlined is that we can talk to people and learn their stories and then actually see it in the data. And that's a really important process to go back between um, interviews and talking to people in focus groups that we're really excited and hoping that we'll do more of this year and going back and looking at the data. That'll make us more effective. It'll make us question ourselves when it's proper to question ourselves. So we're not um, just stuck in numbers, but just really understanding the reality of the world and what's happening. So they're both are important. And the other thing I was thinking, there's a lot that's happening here that can be applied in other regions. I mean, this is an island, as I mentioned, there's the ferries, the airports, so it's maybe a little bit easier to gather some of this info. But uh, we, were, Peter, we were talking about geofencing, and maybe you can explain what yeah. that is. <clears throat> One of the neat things that uh, we can do with the streetlight data is something called geofencing. And just think of it as it's a very flexible prospect whereby we can establish uh, an electronic turnstile around anything we want. We can draw a circle around the airport, we can draw a circle around uh, where the Steamship Authority ferry arrives or where the Highline Fast Ferry arrives. We geofence it and anybody who is carrying a location-based device passing through that geofence registers as one person entering or one person leaving. So people arrive on ferries and hundreds of these things get off they register, they reach a, minim a minimum number so that it can be a crowd, and they say, well, there's a crowd that corresponds to this on the scale. These are, these are people, you know, these are, it's basically uh, tracking uh, location-based service devices, and we then have a ratio of what they are to people. And so we can look at any facility we want. If you were in a different community, you might want to do it around a stadium, mm -hmm. or you might want to do it uh, around a park just to see what kinds of people are coming and going, how many different people are coming and going, what are the patterns of entry and exit at different times of day, when are the crowds <coughs> biggest there. So everything you want to know, and it's real simple, she knows how to 
put a geofence up and count people. I, all I know is that the numbers come out <laughs> and I say, whoa, I've, I've got what I need. Mm -hmm. So Anna, I know you work with a lot of other communities as well, so is there anything you're taking from this project mm -hmm. away to help you when you work with other communities? Yeah, for sure. I have done some um, uh, contracting with local governments and other places where they have a population similar to this and they don't really have a good handle um, resource wise on when people are coming and going and a lot of time that data is in the hands of maybe the Chamber of Commerce or, or maybe the, the businesses but the local government doesn't have as good of a handle so um, I was really excited to take on this project because I saw so many applications in different communities across the US and they might not be as easy as Nantucket as far as the defined ports of entry that most people come in and out of. Um, but one of the things that I like to talk about is if you have a tool and a team, then you can go into almost any problem and you can figure out a great solution. So I think what we've done here is a start. There are other communities that could benefit from it that are more geographically challenging, but we've definitely set a great precedent. Mm -hmm. Um, any final happens. thoughts from either of you? I just want to say that the <clears throat> kind of the tools that have been developed here, this is really a, a work in progress, a starting point. Uh, <clears throat> this approach is so transformative, at least in my field of applied demography, that I can see it gradually filtering out to become something that all towns within the Commonwealth will want to use because we happen to have the unique town census in the town street list in that in Massachusetts but I don't think anywhere else in the, in, the, in the country and we're also getting at the dynamics of population change and a simple way to understand why is it important to know how many different people come here well let's imagine that we had 17,000 people here and we said well once a year I'm gonna go out and our anniversary I'm gonna go shop for something for my spouse now, if it's 17,000 different people coming here every week or month, there's going to be many, many times more husbands who are going to go walking around saying, well, I've got to buy something while we're here for my spouse. We're going to be here for a week or a day or a month. So 20 times, 30 times more purchases by all the different people who are here rather than just the people who reside here year round. That's the kind of insight you get. Anna, any closing thoughts for you? Um, and it's just, it's been an incredible privilege just to work on this project and to work with so many incredibly intelligent people from all over the world and from here in Nantucket. And it's just been a pleasure. I'm glad to meet all of you. Right, thank you. Alan? I'm going to call up uh, Wendy Schmidt. Uh, Wendy is known to many in the community. She's been a critical member of this community. She's the president of Romaine Nantucket and the Schmidt Family Foundation. But she's up here almost not because of that, but because she inspired the first pressing question, who are we as a community? And then she made a, a bold commitment to back this early research, and uh, basically nothing would have happened without her early support. So here's the one. Thanks, Alan. Can you all hear me? Doesn't everything seem friendlier in a room that smells like popcorn? <laughs> That's what I'm thinking about. Uh, congratulations to you, Alan, and Peter, and Victoria, and, uh, and the whole team, my goodness. Um, we love to fund disruptive and interesting new ways of doing things. I think Peter said it, it this is revolutionary, what, what we're looking at here. Um, from my perspective, all of this change sort of started in the 1980s when computers were the size of this theater building. And, and now we're walking around with our iPhones, which were only introduced in 2007, and they certainly have changed the way we do almost everything in the world. Uh, and it ought to affect the way that we think of ourselves, too. Um, at Remain Nantucket, we're so excited about this new platform that can give us accurate, representative, reliable, transparent, and moreover, dynamic ways of looking at this community where I've been told there are 17 languages spoken in the public schools. So who are we? I think that's a really valid question. I know at Remain for the work we've been doing, um, which is about a vital downtown year round for everybody who lives here and visits here. We, we always have asked this question, who are we? We started in 2008. Some of you will remember the Urban Land Institute came uh, and did a panel here. 
They spent two weeks. Uh, they poured through every document they could find, every report, every uh, environmental report, every economic report, um, things that were kind of static that had been sitting on shelves to try to figure out, well, who are these people? What is this island really about? They interviewed also 200 people, uh, which is very important. I'm glad to hear you all looking at the anecdotal side of things because that also informs your overall picture. And we got a pretty good report, I think, uh, that gave us a starting point for thinking about, well, what could a philanthropic entity like Remain actually do? And who are you talking about? And since that time, we've hosted community dinners, 2015, 2016, trying to widen the net. Who are we talking to? What needs, what, what aspirations do people who live here actually have? Um, but we've never had a really good source of quantitative information about the island's uh, changing populations. This methodology just didn't exist 10 years ago. So it is all new, and we really welcome this platform. Um, I think we're gonna have some fun, and I hope you will too. Other organizations, businesses, nonprofits, organizations on the island, have fun thinking of questions that you can toss to this group. I mean, if you can figure out what beaches people want to go to, you can probably figure out some things that are, are, um, are less, less daunting. Um, just one more note that I think about, which is all technologies, uh, starting with rocks, uh, could be used for good purposes and used for bad purposes. So it all depends on us. It depends on us as a community, what, what kind of world we want to see. I think that was a wonderful way to put that. But I also know that all these platforms that have been established in my lifetime that we call technology have really tended over time to improve the lives of billions and billions of people on Earth. So we can have our fears, we should have our cautions, but it's really a time of great optimism and change for Nantucket and I hope as a model for other communities too. Thanks everybody for coming. Privacy has been a topic that we could spend uh, hours and hours on. Um, and we've certainly spent a lot of time with our advisory board. And it was important enough that we spent a lot of time working on it, and it is the back cover. So uh, we would recommend that you read through it. Uh, we have a specific email address, privacy at nantucketdataplatform.com. We want to hear from the community. Uh, we want to learn from the community. And, uh, uh, and happy to talk uh, to anyone more about that. So what's next? Uh, are there other pressing questions? Uh, there are a million. Um, you know, we call this V1, but it's really V1 million because we did a million things to figure out what we figured out so far. Uh, but V2 is not another million things. There's probably 20 obvious things we want to figure out. Um, and so we'll keep working on it. Uh, behavioral health I talked about, there is a, a calendar of crisis that happens here as people move through a busy summer into a period of exhaustion, they make it through the holidays, the dark period of the winter, the stress of spring and where am I gonna live in the summer? And we think there's data around that and it could inform uh, uh, community um, uh, services on how they get staffed. And if we know there's a crisis in January, maybe we ought to be staffing up in August. So that's one that's of significant interest to us. Um, housing, does anyone think there's a housing issue here? This is a massive one. I can't tell you how many people I've talked to about housing. Um, and so there's a lot to learn there. Uh, Peter mentioned the 2020 census. We're working with the town. We're engaged on three projects for the town. This is one of them. Uh, the first is to make sure they have an accurate list of who's here. We had a meeting about that today. We're working hard to support the 2020 census. Uh, we're working with the select board. They did a strategic plan. And uh, they may find what we, find what we may find, which is, I don't know how many people are going to read this. I hope you all read it. Uh, but I bet if when we post all our visualizations, I bet more people will look at our visualizations than will read the paper. And so we're going to help them with a visualization strategy to make sure that citizens understand what's in the plan and we can watch them and see how they're doing to achieve their goals. Uh, we're working on a finance dashboard. Um, uh, Julia Lendner and uh, Brian Turbot in the finance department built their own dashboard. Uh, they should have been very proud of it. And, uh, and we want to help them, and we're supporting them with uh, some support from Remain, and we're going to build V2 so they can actually see what's happening in the economy. The fear with a town government or any business is, when are the trees going to stop growing to the sky, and what does that mean? And so uh, hopefully that will help them with some budget planning. We want to do some work on ticks uh, in mobility data. The quick version is, 
there's pretty good records on where people get uh, bit by ticks. Uh, but if 10 people get bit over here and 10 get bit over here, you need to know how many people were there. Because if there were only 10 people here and a million here, you know you have a real problem over here. So we'd like to use some of our mobility data. And that could lead to a tick app. Imagine that you want to go for a walk with your dog. And you can say, gee, the wind is out of the north and the temperature is dropping. And we know this is when ticks are active. Let's go somewhere else. So that's a, a bigger vision for that. Uh, we talked a little bit about qualitative research. And uh, we'd like to set up a survey panel so we can go to year-rounders, summer folks, uh, seasonal workers, year-round workers, and have a statistically reliable panel. We're working on that with one of our advisory board members who has a survey company, Hugh Davis. So that could be a big breakthrough, that we could actually get reliable feedback in brief surveys. Um, does anyone care about cars, traffic, or parking? Uh, I probably don't have to say anything about that, but the part that interests me most personally is an idea that Jake and I talked about, which is could we put sensors on UPS and FedEx trucks and have that data transmitted to the DPW so they would actually know the condition of the dirt roads. So you could get to the one that had the biggest problem. And since I live on Dukes Road, this <laughs> would save me many calls a month on the condition of our road. <coughs> uh, weather, uh, you, you had a little, uh, a little view about weather. So we've had some awesome advisors, and uh, they are around uh, the country. I want to uh, say here the last, uh, let the last be the first, in Newtown, Connecticut, but really Nantucket, is Joe Smilowski. Joe is here in the audience. Joe has been, he deserves a round of applause. Um, I, I met Joe a year ago, and I didn't know I was going to have uh, a colleague who uh, outworked me and outthought me and outmanaged me. Uh, and, uh, you know, we wouldn't be nearly as far without Joe pushing and aspiring and, and driving us. And uh, he's exhausted. He's no longer chairman of the advisory board, uh, but he's still an advisor and a trustee. And uh, I have deep appreciation uh, for the work you did, Joe. Uh, we have trustees who have given us uh, philanthropic support. Um, and, uh, and that's a three-year uh, small commitment. And that has been, or, uh, uh, it's meaningful um, and, and hugely helpful. We could not have done this without their support. And, uh, and I would call out Bruce Miller, who recruited a number of our trustees, cares deeply about this community and about evidence-based decision-making. And so a round of applause for Bruce. <laughs> and then we built this uh, virtual data team uh, of people uh, you know, in California and Oregon. Um, uh, there's Anna in North Carolina, but it's international. I was on the phone, uh, we were talking to people in India today and uh, in Argentina. Um, and uh, this team has been awesome and would not have been ho possible without our technologist, Victoria Powers, my wife. Uh, so I have the added benefit of having an amazing colleague and an awesome spouse. So cheers to Victoria. <laughs> we, we, we wouldn't have come close, not without Victoria. And so there's one more thing. So we look for inspiration wherever we can see it. And one thing that I love is this website, Nantucket Ferries. And many of you, I'm sure, know it. But they have this bold idea of, of, uh, of gathering data and putting it in one place. So instead of having to go, when's the High Line? When's the steamship? And back and forth, which we all do all the time, you go to NantucketFerries.com. And now if you're going from Hyannis to Nantucket, there are all the ferries. And you know what time you can go. And you just go, oh, i got to go to the High Line. It's like really good. So we were talking about it and we said, well, what if we could take all the stuff we did, like the, the information on visitors, and what if we could take, uh, you know, ferries, and, you know, we know when the airlines fly. Could we, and we have all this mobility data, could we just, like, do this? And so we did it. So this is a day in Nantucket. This is a Saturday in July. And you can see, I'll orient you as we go. So it's five in the morning, and the little red dots are the mobility data. They're showing you where there's um, some people and activity. And on the far right, you'll see the red dots. So the more intense red will tell you more people. And there's also a counter that will start. And um, uh, I'll, I'll talk about it as we go. That's the screen's getting lighter because the sun's coming up. And there goes the 630 ferry. <laughs> so we know 363 people left on that ferry. There's another one coming in. So it's 8 in the morning, and the town's really waking up.
And the uh, green lines you see are planes landing, and that's according to a schedule provided by the airport. So we know where they, when they came and where they left and where everyone went. And you're starting to see Scots that come to life a little bit. And so where are these people going? That's where they're going. That's where they're coming from. And now around 10.30, you'll see the counter uh, on the right, the net is zero. So the, remember the chart I showed you before? We're back to net zero. Now we're starting to build. We want to zoom in on our little neck of the woods. You'll see the New Bedford Ferry. I knew it was true when I saw that. I thought that was just so cool. We didn't just have the steamship in the High Line. We had the Sea Streak. So now we're going to look at an afternoon. This is one in the afternoon. We're up about 1,200 people uh, at about 1.30. And uh, town is incredibly dense. You can see the beaches are pretty dense, right? Mattaquet, super busy. A little bit of Cisco. Surfside's busy. Everyone has made it out to Claudette's for lunch in Sconset. And uh, there's a little action happening at the Wall Winnet. And we know afternoon is the time when people start to leave, so we're going to zoom out and see what's happening with those in a minute. It's amazing how many ferries there are. So tons of afternoon traffic. So the population now is up to 41,344. It just dipped a little, but it'll start going back up. So then we thought, oh, who gets to Madikit early for sunset? So it's 5.30, it's a little early. Some people want to get there with their wine and maybe have two bottles instead of one. So we wanted to see how busy that was. And you will see it does get busier. We're now at 6.30, so we're an hour from sunset. Couple more dots. So now eight should be winding down, but guess what? Downtown's still super busy. Milestone Road's still busy. Scott's it's a little quieter, actually. While Winnet had good business that night, they're doing fine up there. A lot of action. And people are still hanging out in Madikit even though the sun's going down. So we're now at 9.40, and if you sort of keep an eye on town, you'll start to see it get a little lighter. Uh, nobody at Cisco, Surfside is empty. Nobody on the beach this late. Not even my kids, I'm sure. And there you are, midnight. We, uh, I made the bold call two weeks ago. I said, we're not going to show it. It's not far enough along. And the look on the face of that team who had spent hundreds of hours uh, and man, did they just work overtime. It's incredible. Uh, thanks to Victoria and the data team. That's amazing. <laughs> so in closing, you know, the highest form of peer review is when you write something and you present it to your peers. And in the academic world, it's a scientific paper that you present at a conference. And uh, we've had plenty of internal peer review from our team of demographers. Um, but if you're focused on community data, we think the best peer review happens at a meeting with the community. And that's what we tried to do to this afternoon. And it's really the start, because we want to encourage feedback. And that's my email, and have at it. You know, really important decisions are going to be made in this community uh, over the next year, five years, 10 years, and decades. And the decisions have major implications. How we spend and invest capital, how we educate our children, how we care for the sick, how we take care of seniors, how we help small businesses grow. And we hope this is an important moment for the community, a moment when citizens engage. We agree with Jake totally. And as Wendy said, when pressing questions get identified, 
we've got a lot of questions and we haven't even started. And we sh we're sure you have even more. So about 18 months ago, this group decided we wanted to live in a place with a data resource like this. And since then, we've gone much farther, frankly, than I thought we'd get in a year. But we also know we've got a ton more to do. So thank you for your curiosity. You're obviously curious people, or you wouldn't be sitting here on a beautiful afternoon. We appreciate you coming very, very much, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you for coming.